when you see other families suffering, I don't get comfort out of that. I just try to work harder and figure there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. Somebody upstairs knows better than me. Come on, give me a hint I'm, and let's go try. Big Island ranching pioneer and lifetime community volunteer, Herbert Montague Richards Jr., better known as Monty, shares his love of the land next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. High in the Kohala Mountains on the northern tip of the Big Island is Kahua Ranch. Kahua meaning the beginning, the source, the foundation. Herbert Montague Richards Jr., better known as Monty Richards, is a third generation member of the Kahua Ranch family business and a fifth generation Kama Aina descended from Protestant missionaries. As the former president and general manager of Kahua Ranch, Monty Richards spent over a half century with his late wife Phyllis on the homestead while raising a family of four and their grandchildren. His dream of a career in ranching came to him while spending childhood vacations at Kahua. In 1953, with an agriculture degree in hand, Monty began work for the company. His initiation was learning the ropes at the company's slaughterhouse in Honolulu. I did most of the jobs they had there, including rolling hides, which is if you've never rolled hides, you have no idea. What is rolling hides? Rolling hides is, these are hides that are taken off the animal. And they go in a salt pack. You actually salt them down. You lay them out on the, on the ground and shovel fulls of salt. And then when, it, when they're cured, you have to fold them up. And in those days, we used to have to tie them up. And then, then, they're, then they're loaded on a flat trailer and in those, I think we were shipping some to the mainland, some to Korea in, in those days. What for? What, what do they use the hides uh, for? Well, shoes, belts, handbags, all the rest of those good things. The smell was out of sight and, and the hides are heavy, you know, they're 60 pounds of that sort and I have howly hands and, and we use hide rope, which is a, which is a sisal type of a rope which can cut because you're in, you're in salt. Boy, it used to burn. So you graduated with this degree and then came back and did this kind of a junk job. You have to learn. You have to learn. Maybe you are told how to do the job, but until you get out and do it, you don't realize how hard the work is. And when you are going to give orders to get people to do it, they know that you have done it. And that makes all the difference in the world. In terms of labor, that's probably one of the toughest jobs. You used to do that on Saturdays, which is, you know, you don't work five days and then you get two days off. And, but there are all kinds of jobs. I, I delivered meat. And in those days, you used a pickup truck. You didn't have these nice big vans with all the chill and all. You just pick up truck, you cover them with a canvas, and you drive down and you know Chinatown and all you double park and and you and you load quarters of beef on your shoulder and you take them into the take them into the market but you know those quarters weigh about a hundred and a quarter 150 pounds and you're 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 walking through a, a, a narrow aisle with, with, with people buying all around you got to be careful you don't knock anybody down as you swing because uh, it, it's sticking out about three feet in front. Were they deliberately giving you the roughest jobs because they needed to see whether they I were testing so. you? I think so. And, and it should be done that way. So they didn't give you any chance? Nope. Any break? Nope. And you'd get, and if you were wrong, you were politely told where you were wrong. So you just do it, then later on they transferred me to the Big Island. So you're one of the hands? That's right. You, you, you rode your horse, you, you know, you saddled, you caught your horse at 6.30 in the morning and off you went. Did you like it? Were you saying, about then, were you saying, why did I want to get into this business? It depends on the weather. If the weather is fine, no. If it's raining, yes. And the wind is howling at about 20 to 30 miles an hour 
and you're hunched over and your horse is hunched over and you hope he doesn't buck you off and, 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 you're, and your slicker's you know, hitting the horse and all. You wonder, well, what am I doing here? You just keep remembering that many of the people that you went to school with are junior accountants in a bank in New York City and think of the life that those folks lead. You know, the, the Wall Street folks would just wait till Friday afternoon, they'd jump in their car and they'd go to the farm. They'd have about an hour and a half drive and then they would spend a day and a half on the farm. Listen, clown, you're living it all the life. You're living it every day. So don't grumble, you got it made. Monty Richards is recognized for his pioneering efforts in high intensity, rapid rotational grazing techniques and also for diversifying the business. This includes experiments with hydroponic farming and eco-friendly energy sources such as wind and solar power. Tourists are also invited to visit and explore Kahua's breathtaking scenery. I've been looked upon as kind of a maverick that do things differently. For instance, I started with motorcycles here. I got started on that. And people thought it was terrible, and it probably was. So to try to make it work a little better, I referred to them as Japanese quarter horses. So to have a little bit of the, you know, a little, little, little bit of the pizzazz still left in it. We use ATVs now, and all most ranches do. They make the ranch much smaller because you're able to move around and you're able to get things done. So you never know. Some things work well, others don't work well. And of course, cattle aren't the only things you grow. No, we grow sheep. We're the largest sheep, sheep rancher in the state, which doesn't say much. We have about 800 ewes. How many cattle? Well, mother cows, uh, Kahua is about 4,000. And you're, you're doing these uh, hybrid? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're crossing in. Within the 4,000, uh, we work with Wagyu cattle, you know, Kobe beef. That's what we raise. And the unfortunate thing is so much of our cattle go to the mainland to be raised and fed. Getting the Wagyu in is working well with, with grass-fed. Uh, we are able to kill a bunch of cattle here, and we run a little store at the ranch, and we sell sheep and, and cattle and Wagyu. In the case of cattle, the gestation period is nine months. So if you breed a cow, nine months later, hopefully you get a calf. She stays with mama about eight months. So here we are, now we're up 17 months. Now you raise it on, gr on grass another, another three months. Then you're about four months in, in feeding the animal before it is harvested. It's a long time. It's expensive. And, oh yes, but it's experimentally, you've got to figure which ones are going to do the, do the best job for you. And when you're experimenting, you've got a long wait. They're not like chickens that turn over generations where extremely quickly. So how is your experiment working out? You've done this for generations mm -hmm. of, uh, of cows. Well, of the Wagyu, for instance, you can't get uh, any matter out of Japan. In other words, in other words, they won't ship any more any more semen to you for AI or anything like that. So you've got to use what you have in the United States and breed up with them, and tr tr try to get to the highest percentage that you can. We started at Kahoa breeding artificially. The first calves hit the ground in 1966, and we were using Hereford and Angus at that time. And you know we've since moved on and. And, 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 and we're continuing to breed Angus and Hereford, but it takes a long time. So how, is, uh, how, how have your um, customers changed? Who do you sell to now versus who you sold to before? Well, there's been quite a change from the, from the before. We ended up shipping t to the mainland at about, I don't know, t I'm guessing uh, 10 years ago. I've forgotten when we, when we closed down all, all the meat facilities here. Uh, I was president of Kahoa Beef Sales and Kahoa Meat Company here on Oahu. Parker Ranch closed the Hawaii Meat Company and all the rest. J just so that was quite a break. In in that in, in those days prior to that, we used to we used to sell to the Food Lands and the Times and the Stars and all the rest. And that's and the majority of the meat that was raised here was sold here. 
now that we've gone to the mainland, uh, by far, the, most all the meat is sold on the mainland. Well, yeah, why is that? Well, be, we're not bringing it back because it's too hard to, to ship it both ways when you, and, and you have to keep the, a, a good point as to is this the original meat that came here and all the rest. Uh, I, I, I laughingly say that people say you are what you eat. So you all, all, always ought to eat Hawaiian beef. The reason is because our Hawaiian beef on the mainland has had an ocean voyage. Now, how many, how many steaks have had an ocean voyage? <laughs> and then when you come to the mainland, when you come to either Canada or, or uh, California, got to have a nice long truck ride. So it's had the ability to see the country. <laughs> so, your, so your cattle are well acclimated to having traveled. So if you eat that beef, you're getting some of that in you. And that's got to be a it's got to be extremely healthy. <laughs> well, why do you ship them away? Why don't? Why can't they just live live their entire lives here and be consumed here? We are trying to that. We need new slaughterhouse. We need that. We do not have the facilities. We've got to get the infrastructure back that 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 we lost at the time they were sold. At the time it was closed, people in Honolulu wanted U.S. choice meat. Oh. Didn't want any of this grass fat stuff anymore. Nope didn't want it. Now the whole thing has changed. Now people, because of the health thing, want grass fat. Okay. Now because it's leaner steak? Leaner, uh, tastes better, it's better for you, et cetera, et cetera. But now we've got to build back the infrastructure that was lost. And that's extremely expensive. And the expense is caused by, number one, the time has, that we live in. And number two is the amount of, of, of federal regulation that is involved. So you pretty much have to start with a clean sheet of paper. Cattle ranching in 2010 presents a challenge to ranch owners who are struggling economically. Kahua Ranch is no exception. My feeling is that if you have a piece of land, the land must work for you. You work with it, but you, it must work for you. Now, the, you can have cattle on it, and that's fine but your land isn't really working. The amount of money you can harvest from one animal, the amount, not much, not enough. You gotta make the land do something else. That's why we had, that's why we had the visitor industry on it. ATV riding, taking people, letting them see things, see a ranch going. There you begin to make the, make the land, the land work. You are number one, you are educating people that come on the place as to what you're doing and you're showing people why they're coming to Hawaii because they'll see agriculture in operation. We've hit this t tough times now. That's, that's, that's slowed way down. I think we'll be able to pick it up, but you always have to realize that the, that the, the end game in land is houses. Once you get in houses, you know, the game's up. I've, do you really want to do that? Have people approached you with some nice big offers for your land? Well, I fend them off. I don't get down, get down serious. We could sell it, it'd be no problem. It's some of the most beautiful land in the state. But there's more to being a land owner than only looking for the so-called highest and best use. And the highest and best use of any land is subdivision. You ought to be smarter and make the land work for you and, and help you, which in turn helps your fellow man. But on the other hand, you've tried all kinds of things and the economy hasn't helped and uh, weather often hasn't helped. I mean, how are you doing at this point in 2010 with the family business? Not very well but you don't give up. You don't give up. How much does it wear on you? I mean, you know, you, you, you employ people, your family's living on the property. When you see other families suffering, I don't get comfort out of that. 
I'm just trying to work harder and figure there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way. Somebody upstairs knows better than me. Come on, give me a hint I'm, and let's go try. And, and, and that's, I'm, you're, you're getting into my philosophy of life, but that's the way I, I looked at it. Never give up. Nope. Keep trying. That's right. And what about, at what point do you consider taking an extreme right or left turn as opposed to pers persevering and moving in that same direction? I haven't gotten there yet. I don't know. How was it when you turned over the reins of the business to your son, Tim, a few years ago <laughs> after, after being the boss for a long time, decades? <laughs> it's interesting. When you decide to do that, you, you, that's a switch. You're either full on or you're full off. You better go full on if that's what you want and you turn it over. My tongue is two inches shorter. <laughs> <laughs> the protein that I've eaten has been my tongue. <laughs> but I've tried to stay positive. And support him as yes. he runs the business. That's correct. But you do things, some I do things different. differently. Yep. Yep. At what point do you step back and say, hey, got to listen to me on this one? You wait for him to come and ask you. And that's a difficult point. And sometimes, oftentimes, let me use the word often, oftentimes his ideas are better than yours. Maybe perhaps in ranching it's different, but it, ju it just seems that it's very hard to keep a family business or dynasty going. Extremely difficult, extremely difficult. And uh, it has to do with family dynamics. What you're really looking at, do you want the family farm? Because you're rapidly running out of family farms from the tax standpoint. Do you want all big corporate farms? Do you want a meeting held weekly in X county Ohio, where about 10 people decide what the price of corn will be or the price of soybeans, a different 10 people. Do you want that? Is that going to be in the best interest of the United States? I think not. But how many people think that through? How many people face that question? Well, how many people can withstand um, tough times? That's right. How many people have got the guts to stand up full time? Listen, if you, if you want to wear a sword, you better be prepared to draw the sword and get into the fight. I think of um, you're living in a place where King Kamehameha the Great is said to have trained for battle. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just steeped in antiquity at the same mm -hmm. time it serves you today. Any thoughts about that? The area that he was supposed, that his guard were trained and all is Kahua land. I would certainly like to be able to keep it the way it is now or improve it from an agricultural standpoint but not split it up the house sites. We did sell a bunch. Ko Kohala Ranch was part of Kahua at one time and that was it but we stopped at a line below the cinder cones because this other shows where Kamehameha was. And do you foresee a time when there might be family dissension about whether to sell off land yep. for housing, yep. for real estate purposes? Yep. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because if a person owns a ranch and you're not making money, it's costing you money, what are you gonna do? And we've gotta be smart enough to make sure that they're, that, that they're profitable. Do you know what do you, what are you hoping for? What, what do you think might be the next best thing for the ranch? Well, you, you make the land do something. Visitors, that sort, which keep it in agriculture, but nevertheless let more and more people enjoy it. And when they, if you do a job, you can charge for it and everybody is happy. So it sounds like you don't look for easy work. No, I just, I just look for work. <laughs> <laughs> and do you like it when it has a physical element to it? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, certain, when you talk about, talk about physical, and I won't ride a horse anymore. I won't even get on a horse. 
if you fall down off a horse, when you get to be about my age and something busts, it may heal, but it'll be a long, long time and it may never heal. So don't put yourself in that position. Um, and a neighbor islander, and especially a Hawaii islander, has a different sensibility about life in Hawaii. Probably do. Mm -hmm. And what, what should people in Honolulu know about, about um, Hawaii as seen through your eyes? Well, you mean what do they look at the big island and they don't see? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one thing, East Hawaii versus West Hawaii. To me, that is terrible. That is one island. You better damn well realize it's an island. Um, Hawaii Island Economic Development Board is about 20 some years old. I was the first president of that. I fought to make sure that people would realize that the island of Hawaii is the island of Hawaii. There's not East Hawaii and West Hawaii. And that has dogged that island from now, well, as far as I know and including now, because you will find that the East Hawaii seems to have better roads. They seem to all the rest of the stuff. Why? Because where is the, is the, 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 the head hall, so to speak, is in Hilo. The mayor of Hilo and all the rest, I keep saying, listen, let me tell you something, folks. What's gonna come, what's gonna come about is West Hawaii, with all the housing and all that's going on, all the millionaire homes, that's gonna be where your tax money is gonna come from. And they're not gonna sit still to have East Hawaii get everything in. Here, here's a little, a little pin for West Hawaii. You have to have the island of Hawaii. And I said, you wait till you get a mayor from West Hawaii and you see what's gonna happen. You think you guys know what's coming? You ain't seen nothing yet because they're gonna take you apart. You've got to realize you're a whole island, you're one island, and this, they've even gone so far as to have, well, maybe we should have two separate mayors and two separate police force, ridiculous, ridiculous. With no desire to run for public office like his father before him, Monty Richards, a lifelong Republican, has instead served as a volunteer for countless civic organizations and on government boards. For 16 years, he was a member of the University of Hawaii's Board of Regents and a board director for Bank of Hawaii. Taking a leadership role with another organization helped him work through a lifelong problem with stuttering. When I was in grade school, I could hardly get a word out. Hmm. It would get a little better, a little worse, a little better, a little worse. When I went to the ranch, I would stammer a lot more than I do now. But I became, a, became the president of a rotary club. And boy, that's a bear, because every week you've got to run the meeting and you better be prepared. So my first meeting, I remember I stood up, looked at everybody, and I said, okay, I'll be doing this every week. You boys are gonna wanna sit in the front row, it's up to you, but I suggest you bring umbrellas and raincoats because, <laughs> <laughs> because you might get wet before this thing's over. Well, by, by going over and doing that, I find it, it actually helped the stammer. Look at many of the people with real handicaps the people with one leg, the people who have, well, I've got a very good friend. I call him a, a, a very good friend. His name is Senator Inouye. Look how he has done with one arm. And he's carrying shrapnel inside. And he's 84 years old or something like that. Look, there's a man that has done something. There's a man that is really doing something. You gotta take your hat off to him that those are the people that you got to admire and you see what they've done. How different do you feel than 20 years ago? You still feel the same inside? About the same. It's up to huff and puff a little more, but, but other than that, like, you get up in the morning and you say, listen, if you don't hear nice music, <laughs> you figure, hey, it's all right. Then you get up and you look around. If you don't see the, the grim reaper with a scythe, you're okay. If you do see him, run faster. That's about the only way to do it. 
With the latest smartphone in hand, Monty Richards continues to utilize and promote innovative technology. In addition to his role as chair and trustee of Kahua Ranch, he's spending his retirement continuing to serve and advocate for Hawaii's agricultural community. Mahalo Monty Richards in North Kohala for sharing your long story short, and thank you for watching and supporting PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is produced in HD by PBS Hawaii with Sony Technology. High definition, it's in Sony's DNA. Do you think missionaries have gotten a bad rap in today's history of Hawaii? Yep, and it's unfortunate. How do you look back on it? I look back on it, I think it's, uh, it's bound to be. Anytime you have any envy, you always try to chop down something else, and that's, you know, that's part of the life. But if if you're if you're the the chopper or the choppy, <laughs> it makes a difference. If you're the chopper, why it ain't bad? If you're the choppy, it it, it it actually actually hurts a little. But uh, but you have to push on. You have to push on. And when asked, don't be afraid to say no because this, that, and the other. But you don't go looking for a fight. But if they want to fight, you give it to them.